It is the season of Advent where we wait and prepare for the coming of Christ. And so at this time, we will uh, invite Gary and Julie Eves to light our Advent wreath. Today, we are lighting the candle of joy. During this time, I will read a blessing where I will read the part of one, and then y'all will come in when it says, y'all. Let us pray. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God. In Christ, you visit us and redeem us. In Christ, you raise up a mighty Savior for us. In Christ, you deliver us from all that seeks to destroy us. In Christ, you show great mercy to us. You keep your promises and your covenant. And I think we're almost there. Fill us with your power and peace so we may speak and serve without fear. In unholiness and righteousness all our days for the honor and glory of your name. Amen. And we're going to pray for the tech gremlins. I invite you to rise in body or in spirit as you are able for our hymn of gathering, O Come All Ye Faithful, which can be found on page 234 in the hymnals. Let us sing. standing as you are able as we share an affirmation of our faith for Advent that calls to us the, the promise and hope of our sister Mary. Christians, what is your commitment? Like our sister Mary, we say yes. Yes to your favor, your presence, your blessing. Yes that we are enough just as we are where we are. Yes to your calling and the power of the Holy Spirit coming upon us to fulfill it. Yes to bearing and birthing your word and your promises and your kingdom in this time and place. Yes to all things being possible with you. Like our sister Mary, we say, here I am, 
the Lord's humble servant. As you have said, let it be done to me, in me, through me. Like our sister Mary, we sing and celebrate you, our God, our liberator. For though we are your humble servants, you have noticed us. You may be seated. Let us pray. Lord of eternal light and love, you speak and worlds come into being. You breathe and life takes form. You are the source of all things. Creator God, redeeming word, sustaining wind, Speak now into this season of shadow and waiting your joy of the light that is on its way. <clears throat> Breathe into us your love that is coming to dwell among us. I invite you to focus on your breathing. Inhale and exhale. Inhale and exhale. Pay attention to how your breath moves in your body. Notice where there is peace and notice where there is pain. In your breathing, will you pray this with me? On your inhale, say, speak joy in my life, Lord. Speak joy in my life, Lord. One more time. Speak joy in my life, Lord. And on your exhale, say, I am waiting for your light. I am waiting for your light. Let's do that rhythm a few times. Speak joy in my life, Lord. I am waiting for your light. Speak joy in my life, Lord. I am waiting for your light. Speak joy in my life, Lord. I am waiting for your light. Silently or aloud, repeat this breath prayer. What might God be saying to you? What is being revealed? (coughs) 
in this season, we wait for your son. In this silence, we wait for your word. We open ourselves to receive what you might say to us today. And we breathe with you, Lord, while we wait. Speak joy in our lives, Lord. We wait for your light, the light of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, I am pleased to invite Martha Ross up to share a ministry update about our sister churches in Cuba. Bendiciones. I bring you greetings this morning from our fellow Cuban brothers and sisters in our 10, soon to be 12, sister churches who are located in Las Tunas province in eastern Cuba. Before 1959, Methodists in Cuba had over 10,000 active members, which dropped almost immediately to less than 2,000. Today, there are over 50,000 members with Sunday attendance of over 80,000 across the country of Cuba. Methodist United in Prayer is a, is a, um, a way we have in Florida of connecting with our brothers and sisters in Cuba who used to be part of our conference. And we now have sister churches. We started with one sister church in 2006. Bob Brown was able to visit in 2007. They didn't even have a building to meet in. They sat on benches outside. Over the years, we began to send mission trips. And by 2017, we became the first church in Florida to sponsor five churches. It was known as a cluster. Since then, our cluster has continued to grow, and we are hoping this year to add two more churches and become 12 so that we can be like the apostles and have 12 apostle churches in Cuba. What do we do with a sister church? We support their pastors. Pastors in Cuba receive an average of 30 US dollars a month in salary. That supports them and their family. And so we help with a supplement to that. It supports pastors for part of the year. The Cuba Conference supports them for the rest of the year. For $380, that includes a conversion fee, you can help sponsor a pastor's family for a year in Cuba. Can you imagine living on 30 US dollars? I heard recently from one of the pastors, because they're having a problem with food shortages down there, that it costs 16 US dollars to buy a quarter kilo of chicken. That's not a lot of meat. So that is one way you can support them. We raise money here in the church to do that also. We support them with computers, with phones, with phone minutes. When we go down on mission trips, we take as much as we can stuff in suitcases. And we support them with clothes. and. Um, over-the-counter medicines, and all of those things which are difficult to find in their economy. We started with a church in Marshan, which is out in the country on what is known as one of the worst roads in all of Cuba. I can tell you it is. We have practically walked down that road, have ridden down there behind tractors and all kinds of conditions. And that church, though, has been such a blessing. It was our first church. And the pastor there has a degree in agriculture, and he was able to obtain some land through a grant from the government a number of years ago, and now has a wonderful farm. He's close enough to four of our other churches that they go out and help on the farm, and they are doing labor by hand on that farm with an oxen plowing for them. 
and they have acres out there where they grow all kinds of crops which are sustaining the people of those congregations during this time of real need in Cuba. So we have helped with that farm. The last thing we helped them with was an irrigation system. We have bought houses for churches to meet in because most of our churches are house churches. The pastor lives in the home and on Sunday they clean out everything and put in benches and chairs so that the church can meet there. So all of those things are important. We hope to be able to go back to Cuba this coming February on a mission trip. We don't know yet how many people are going to be able to go. We don't know the details. We're working on it right now, but it may be late February or early March. If you're interested in going and meeting our sisters and brothers in Cuba who pray for you three times a day as a church, they consider Coronado their church as we consider their churches, our churches, and our families. I ask you to pray with me for them on a daily basis, and I wish you Feliz Navidad on behalf of them. We'd like to invite the ushers forward. Let us pray. Jesus, you are the light of the world and we rejoice in brothers and sisters and siblings all over this world who love you and follow you. We bless you and thank you for a soon to be 12 congregations, uh, for the church in Cuba growing and blossoming in the midst of persecution and food shortages, in the midst of um, horrible drinking water, in the midst of the need, so much need, and yet your Holy Spirit is powerful and at work in that place. Uh, we pray blessing and provision for them, and we recognize the blessing and provision you have provided us. And so we give you honor and glory and pray that you would make us one in you. We ask this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.
Amen, amen, amen. Now would be a great time for you to share uh, the light of Christ with one another, to pass the peace, say peace be with you, give a good wave, good morning, peace be with you, peace be with you up in the balcony, peace be with you tech team, peace be with you folk online, peace be with you choir. Aren't we looking forward to tonight? Yes, we are looking forward to tonight. Who are you bringing with you? Who, who, oh yeah, you know. Bring some folk, bring some folk, it's gonna be lovely. Uh, today we continue our sermon series, God Bless Us Everyone. It is based on A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. I would invite you to take the Bible you brought with you or one that is near you in the pew. Maybe you have one on your phone or your tablet and to turn to John chapter one, verses 14 through 18. John chapter one, verses 14 through 18. When we think of the Christmas story, we think of you know, the first couple of chapters in Matthew, the first couple of chapters in Luke. You need to include the first chapter of John. Uh, it also talks about uh, the coming of Christ. So John chapter one, beginning at verse 14, and I've also got verse 14 up on the screen for us. And the word became flesh and lived among us. That is what Christmas is all about. This is the mystery of the incarnation uh, that we celebrate every year. It is God with us in the flesh. It is God pitching a tent and moving in. It is God becoming one of us and one with us. Let's read this entire verse together. And the word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth full of grace and truth. And so in Jesus, there is 100% grace and 100% truth. And we need both. So what is grace? It's one of those fancy church words, right? What is grace? Turn to your neighbor and tell your neighbor what you think grace is, okay? Turn to your neighbor, what do you think grace is? Let us know. What do you think grace is? Yeah. Right, grace. We hear it a lot. Methodists are really grace people. That's like one of our things, right? So, in Hebrew, the word is hanun. And you got to get the h in it, okay? So, everybody say hanun. It's beautiful, isn't it? Hanun. And so, el hanun is God of grace. El hanun. Right? And so grace is a gift. It's not a gift with purchase, right? Everybody's offering a gift with purchase right now, right? No, no, no. Grace is a gift, just a gift. It is a gift. Undeserved, unmerited, surprise, it's a gift. Grace is a verb, right? It's a verb. It is the unconditional love of God in perpetual action for the benefit of all people and creation. Isn't that great? The, the unconditional love of God in perpetual action for the benefit of all people and all creation. And so, we celebrate the God of grace who is constantly making the first move, constantly reaching out in love to us. We celebrate the God of grace who is constantly, perpetually providing, healing, saving us through the birth and the death and the resurrection of Jesus. We celebrate the grace of God that is perpetually, constantly um, empowering us to become more and more like Jesus who is full of grace and truth, so that we too can be full of grace and truth. Uh, Bishop Will Willimon gives this definition of grace. The power of God working in you 
to give you a transformed life. The power of God working in you to give you a transformed life. And so we see this transformation in A Christmas Carol. We see this transformation in the life of Ebenezer Scrooge, right? And so we know Scrooge at the beginning of the story. How, what is Scrooge like at the beginning of the story? He is nasty. nasty. That's quite the name, okay? He is greedy. He is Yes, selfish, he is right. So Dickens describes him, secret and self-contained, solitary as an oyster. I love that description. That, it, that is just, you get it, that, that one sentence, you get it. He goes on, he says, that Scrooge is squeezing and wrenching and grasping and scraping and clenching. Scrooge is hard-hearted, okay, so... Um, if you don't want a spoiler alert right now, put your fingers in your ears for the next couple of seconds. Okay, so how is Scrooge at the end of the story? Changed. Generous, joyful, giving, right. He is open, he is humble. Um, He is an agent of goodness and justice and blessing in his community. His life is transformed. And we associate that to the work of God, not only in Scrooge's life, but in our lives. It can happen to us as well. Because if we're honest, we got a little Scrooge in us. And some of us have got a lot of Scrooge in us, right? And we need, we need Scrooge at the end of the story. And by the grace of God, that's what can happen. Uh, Look with me at uh, John chapter 1, beginning at verse 16. From his fullness, this is Christ, Jesus' fullness, from his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. You know, I just kind of imagine this grace and truth just pouring out of Christ. And so, verse 17, the law indeed was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Verse 18, no one has ever seen God. It is the only Son, himself God, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. So this is what's going on in A Christmas Carol. Um, There is an awakening going on in Scrooge. There is a knowing going on in Scrooge. And that is what is opening him up to the grace of God making a change in his life. The truth is opening him up to grace. And so, truth, now we need to know what this is. Uh, This is uh, emet, okay, everybody say emet, Emet. right? So we've got chanun, chanun, right? And we've got emet, okay? So el chanun is God of grace, el emet is God of truth. Right? God of truth. And so what is truth? Truth has a firmness to it, like a solid foundation. A solid foundation. And there is a constancy, right? It feels like everything is constantly changing around us, but there is a constancy to the truth of God. It is ageless, it is timeless, it is everlasting, and The truth of God reveals so that nothing is hidden. There is a revealing light, you know? That's truth. And so, are you more a grace person or a truth person? Right? What do you think? For some of us, we're we're kind of lean more towards the truth, that issues matter, rules matter, facts matter. The truth is important. Okay? And it is important. It's absolutely important. But if we have too much truth without grace, the truth can become cold. It can become legalistic. It can become a weapon. Right? And so we look on the chart. High truth is the punching, uh, the boxing glove. Right? Fiery boxing glove. Ever, ever been to church when it was all about truth? 
right? Right? Okay, so maybe, maybe you're kind of lean more to a grace person, right? Um, relationships matter, love matters. It matters to offer space to grow and to change. You know, a little time, we just need a little time, right? But you get too much grace and things become shallow. They become saccharine sentimental. Uh, they become enabling, right? So, you know, like a turtle, we kind of hunker down in the shell and we hide the truth and we avoid the truth all in the name of keeping the peace. Okay, so where is Jesus on the chart, right? Jesus highly values grace, highly values the truth. You know, the law indeed was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And so, what do we need? We need both. We need both. We need grace and we need truth. And so, it is true that Scrooge grew up poor and lonely in a crumbling boarding school. It's heartbreaking to read that. Um, it is grace that Scrooge experienced the love of God reaching out to him through his sister, Fan. It is grace that uh, he experienced the love of God reaching out to him, modeling it for him in the joyful and genu generous Mr. Fezziwig, his first boss. Grace and truth. Um, it is truth that Scrooge chose a life of solitude and selfish greed to protect himself from the poverty he experienced as a child. How many of us are doing that? Trying to protect ourselves, thinking that a bigger bank account will save us, right? Great investments, strong retirement, those are all important things. But a hurricane comes through, and all of a sudden you are in a financial place you never dreamed of, right? So Scrooge thinks that it will protect him. He thinks that this solitude and selfish greed um, is the way to live his life, and he lives it in such a way that he keeps shrinking and turning in on himself, becoming more and more solitary like this oyster, right? So much that he loses his fiance Belle and the chance for the family that he could have had with her. So much that he begins to abuse himself and begins to abuse everyone around him. Grace. Grace is that Scrooge experiences the welcome of God reaching out to him, even though he is like this and making these choices, reaching out to him through his nephew, Fred. The goodness and grace of God, the generous generosity of God reaching out to him through the men who come to his, his establishment, his business, reminding him of the importance of charity. The hope of God reaching out to him through a small boy that just wants to sing him a Christmas carol. Scrooge experiences these ghostly visions, revealing his past and his present and his future. And they are truthful, full of truth. They are visions that open his eyes to these soul-crushing choices that he is making and his deep need for God and for change. And yet, these visions are full of grace. They open him. They open him. They break through that hard oyster shell. They open him to the offer that even you, Scrooge, can be saved. Even you, Scrooge, can change. And so, what do you need right now? Do you need some truth, or do you need some grace? Or do you need a bit of both? Do you need some truth of 
who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for you in his birth and his death and his resurrection? Do you need some truth about who you are and the change that needs to happen, the false things that you are putting your trust in? Or do you need some grace? That God is reaching out to you right now, right where you are that you are beloved of God, right now, right where you are. The grace that is revealing and opening you. The grace that is empowering you for healing and for change. Let's look at uh, verse 16 of the passage we read today. From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. Let's pray. God, we recognize and thank you and bless you that you are full that you are full of truth and full of grace and full of love and full of healing and full of hope. And that out of your fullness we may receive. That out of your fullness we may know what is true and real and lasting. And out of your fullness we may know love and belonging and safety and worth. And so, pour out upon us right now. Reveal what we need so that we may live the truth and grace that you have destined for us. These beautiful gifts. If this is the desire of your heart, I invite you to put your hand over your heart and join me in saying amen. 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 We have a special treat today. Our friends are here to sing for us. Would you welcome the, the kids as they're coming in right now?
Alrighty. Please stand as you're able for our closing hymn. Beloved of God, go now in peace. Go to love. Go to serve. Go with the grace and truth and blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.